Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Fallaway Bell, the Director of Community for Center for Communication. We're an independent nonprofit organization that connects students and with professionals in the media industry in order to better prepare them for their careers. You can follow the center on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter. Our Twitter handle is CINCOM and today's hashtag is Office Hours. This program will be recorded for those who cannot tune in live. You can also watch our panels from recent seasons on our website, YouTube, and Vimeo channels. We do plan on hosting more virtual programs in the, in the coming weeks. Please join us next Thursday, June 25th, with, for Office Hours with Neela Ali. She's the SVP of Commerce at BuzzFeed. So all of you guys who um, have interest in joining BuzzFeed, that's gonna be an exciting one. You can sign up for our upcoming events in our newsletter on our website at centerforcommunication.org. So many thanks to Richard, for Bar Richard Barone for joining us today. Richard is an acclaimed recording artist, performer, producer, and author. He has produced countless studio recordings and worked with artists in every musical genre. His list of collaborators includes Tony, Tony Visconti, Beach Boy, Al Harding, <laughs> <laughs> Sean Lennon, um, Donovan, Moby, the late Lou Reed, and folk legend Pete Steger. Now I'll turn it over to Richard because he can do a much better job of um, talking about his career journey before we take questions. Take it away, Richard. Uh, thank you, Father Day. Thanks for having me. And thanks to the Center for Communications for putting this together. And hi, everybody. How you doing? Um, yeah, you kind of, you know, that's a good nutshell uh, description of my, of my career so far. But, you know, um, it started earlier than I think than some people. I started at age seven on commercial radio. And that was interesting and has been really still stays with me as a part of my thinking in terms of music, because I was on a top 40 radio station at age seven years old. Um, I was obsessed with radio, listening to songs on the radio, and got very much into the sound of the records. And I just loved, um, uh, I wanted to find out how records were made. So I started finding my way into uh, recording studios at a young age, uh, preteen and into my teens. Um, and learning engineering and learning how to make records and how you get the sound of a pop hit record that sounds good on the radio, you know. It was an obsession for me. And through that obsession, I got to meet a lot of the artists, a lot of artists that were coming through. By the way, this was in Tampa, Florida, which was a little bit of an out of the way place, really, from as far as the music industry. There wasn't too much really uh, serious music industry happening in Tampa, Florida. Um, but as I got in high school and as a teen, I got more and more into recording and learning about um, the music industry, the, the labels, the producers. I learned this from being on the radio station too, because I would read the credits on records. Like when you mentioned Tony Visconti, who also uh, has produced some of my own albums. You know, I'd see his credit on David Bowie records or other records that I liked. I was like, that guy's on a lot of records that I like. I'm going to work with him, you know? I, so I started spotting names of artists that I liked and um, music that um, appealed to me. Uh, and being a top 40 radio station at that time, which was late 60s and early 70s, it was a great mix of styles. I mean, you would play a folk record like an artist like Donovan, who I also work with now, you play him next to a James Brown record. Like there was a lot of good mixing of music, musical styles then. That's something that I, that stays with me also, is the idea that music is not, uh, genres can blend and mix. You could, it doesn't have to be so pure. I teach that to my students also when we study. Um, uh, I teach at the New School and we do a class on uh, sort of folk music of Greenwich Village in the 1960s, especially as it evolved into protest music. And even then, that was mixing styles because those people were listening to Motown and other genres of music and different styles, and it all blended and made something unique. So that's a bit of my my early history, you know, was learning that idea. Um, I escaped Florida, finally, uh, when I, right after high school. Uh, I, I met a band that was a New York-based band and they invited me to come up here. And um, I uh, immediately got a job, <laughs> as, of all things, as an actor on As the World Turns, a soap opera, which was not my intention, but it paid the rent, you know? 
And uh, during that time, I was so I was on television, but I, I, I met musicians through an ad in the Village Voice newspaper that formed a group called the Bongos, who were very young, just maybe almost 20 years old. Uh, and we did well. We got we got together. Sounded great. It had a uh, unique sound that was uh, what I like. What I just described it was a combination of genres, a combination of styles. We came up with a sound that was able to be played in dance clubs, but could also make it to the radio. And we got a, a hit on Billboard. And um, I went to England, did a lot of touring in Europe, came back here, and then we were picked up. That was on an indie label called Fetish Records out of London, which was a very cool label that was. Um, you know, independent, completely independent, let us do whatever we wanted. But when we came back to the States, we signed with RCA Records, which was a whole different kind of corporate world. Yet, you know, we accepted that. We understood we were now in the middle of a different business model, you know, and we... How old were um, you then? And um, let's see, it says here that, uh, are we okay? Are we, uh, was it working all right? Those are some yeah, sort yeah, of yeah, yeah. No, I was asking how old were you when you signed that, that first, you know, when you were with the label with RCA? I, was just, I think I was 20, just turning 21 around that time. Okay. Maybe 20 when I signed with RCA. That's still, that contract is still on my desk because, because you know, um, it's the one, it's one of the few contracts I signed. I'll go back to this later and people may want to ask questions about this. But since that era, I've tended to make my contracts license agreements so that the records do not stay with the label forever. But in my first album, it was kind of a forever deal which is interesting to me and it's something that I still kind of look at like hmm how did I do that but again I was very young then and we, we did sign um, uh, an overwhelmingly <laughs> self-contained contract that, that um, you know that was the norm at that time not a very good contract but we loved RCA I still love RCA records I mean it was a, a classic label and we learned a lot I learned a lot being there and they gave us tremendous opportunities, especially to learn how to make better and better records because we had access to the best studios and producers and engineers. So I used that whole era, that whole time in my life I used as a learning experience to be become a better producer, you know? Because I always wanted to produce as well as be a recording artist. It's always been about 50-50 for me, like how much time I spend with other artists and how much time I spent on my own music. I mean, I love writing and I love performing, but I also love helping people realize their visions. And uh, the producer is in a unique position to do that, you know? Yeah. So anyway, so yeah, I got uh, on that label. Uh, the Bongos did well. Uh, MTV was just starting around that time. MTV was a network that showed music videos 24-7. So if you had a hit on MTV, it would every couple of hours you were on television. And the bongos were one of their favorite bands. So we uh, benefited from that. And that got us touring, endless touring, literally endless touring. We were doing 300 shows a year for about several years. Because um, people knew us, we were in their homes on television. Um, it eventually, I couldn't, <laughs> we couldn't go on much longer. It just got to be too much. The, the, the schedule was overwhelming and we kind of broke, went our separate ways. I'm not gonna say broke up because we still do occasional shows, but we went our separate ways and um, I started doing a different kind of music. I got involved, I got interested in African percussion and other kinds of music. Again, blending genres. How do we blend classical with African rhythms. How do we blend these instruments that are complete from different parts of the world? How do we put them together? And I made an album called Cool Blue Halo, which was live here in New York, recorded in a nightclub. And it did well for me internationally. Um, with cello, percussion, and guitars. And it was very orchestral with just those few instruments. Um, that got me another few years of being on the road with that album. Uh, and then I got, uh, from that, I got signed to Universal Music and started recording a few albums for them. Uh, again, each label that I signed to was a new learning experience. Um, they all, each label's different and the people I worked with were different. Um, and um, I would say that I continued in that way while still producing other artists for several years until I decided to write a book, which I wrote a book called Frontman. This was in 2008. I'm sure I've skipped over a lot of stuff, but you know, I'm, it's in the book if you want to check it out. Uh, Frontman is about the, it's, it's really a memoir that is based on the idea of being 
the front person of a rock band and what it feels like. The, the whole tone of the book is what it feels like and how I, uh, well, survived it. The subtitle is Surviving the Rock Star Myth. And the book is really about learning how to collaborate. The book is learning how to take a focus away from just myself and making the music about everything and, and letting it be a collaboration with musicians more than ever, more than I had really ever learned before. Um, the book did well for me and I, um, I got a call from NYU. They wanted me to, to teach a class that would use the book as a text, a text. So I wrote a class for NYU for the Clive Davis Institute of Recorded Music called um, Stage Presence. And I, I taught there for three years. And most recently I've been teaching at the New School where I teach a class uh, called Music and Revolution. It's really about music with a message, the history of it, but especially focusing on what happened here in Greenwich Village where I live. We're in Greenwich Village right now. Um, and in the 1960s, it became just a center for youth culture and music and speaking out. And so that course is what I've been teaching at the New School now. And I'm working on my second book, which is called The Power of Song, which is the history of protest music around the world. Hmm. I think that's, I hope that sort of tells you a little bit about what I've done. Um, you know, it's, my life is a learning experience. All of our lives are learning experiences. So uh, I try to uh, make the most of each moment, learn and do more and do better. That was great. No, I, I love that. That was great. Was that okay? Or did that sort of give you a little bit of a who, uh, who Richard Barone is? <laughs> yes. Yeah, so are you ready to take a few questions? I would love that. And I'd like to, yeah, it, uh, I'd be happy to answer whatever you ask, whatever anyone asks. So our first question comes from Kathy at NYU. And let me bring Kathy on. Kathy, go ahead and, and ask your question. Hi, Richard. How are you? Good. How are you doing? Doing well. Thank you for doing this. Um, I was wondering, I know I'm sure you get this question a lot. And it's probably so hard to answer, but you know, it's the one thing I can't figure out or that people have a really hard time wrapping their heads around is really, you know, for, especially for someone on the creative side, breaking into the industry, it feels like such a mystery sometimes and such an impossible challenge. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that and maybe just give some words of, um, you know, inspiration for those of us trying to break in. Absolutely. That's such a good question. And, you know, when I did my, that was my fear, is when I did that full list of things I've done, how I make it seem so easy. That's not really how it is. And what I didn't say, and what I should have said from the very beginning, and it partially answers your question, is that the music industry is all about relationships and building them. It's like every business probably is this, but in the music industry, I think especially, it's ongoing relationships. Many of them are lifelong relationships. Some of the people I signed with at those record labels that I mentioned are still my friends and people that I deal with in music all the time. Um, one suggestion I would give to people that are starting out in the music industry is to build their industry relationships. That means attending events and meeting people. Uh, well, of course, now we have to attend them on Zoom, but there's still ways to keep in touch with people. Um, you you want to think about, it's Kathy, right? Kathy? Yeah. Yeah, I turned her off already. Oh, that's yeah. all right. That's all right. Um, you know, you might want to, uh, like I was saying when I was the littlest DJ, on the radio, I would look for people who I wanted to meet on the credits of records. And I'd make a point when I could, when I was old enough to, to meet them. Um, similarly, I think you have to be, make yourself available to meet people in the music industry who you admire. You know, one thing, like the Center for Communications has a lot of great events that go on all year long. I attend a lot of them personally. And I meet people. It's a great networking opportunity. There, uh, that's a great organization. And there are others like that where you can meet industry people. I think you have to, you have to make contact with the, with the industry personally. It's a, it's a personal industry. And um, that's, a, that's one of my first suggestions to you. You, can also, you know, if you want to elaborate on that more, you can write an email to me. And I'm sure you can get it through Center. Is that okay, uh, 
uh, follow them? Yeah, can yeah write I can definitely share information um, after yeah. the, yeah. So if anyone else has follow-up questions for Richard and he's happy to share his email, I can share that with all the participants. Yeah, go for it. I'm happy to do that. And you know, like for Kathy, you might want to tell me what your situation is and I can help you figure out how you can meet the people that you need to meet in some way whether it's just on email at first or whether it's somewhere where they're going to be speaking or something it's worth it to make a personal contact of some kind with the people that you want to work with you know does that answer do you think yeah no that was great um okay so let's get our next question our next question is from an anonymous um, somebody who wants to stay anonymous and they ask how do you get representation how do you find a manager that's always a, an interesting question. I, uh, when I first started, I didn't have a manager. In fact, the bongos, the group that I was in, I also failed to mention because I was trying to be brief. We didn't want any kind of manager. <laughs> we wanted to be totally do it yourself. We wanted to have our own style, our own management, everything. Well, that was fine for a while. But when we signed with RCA Records, the woman who signed us there, her name is Nancy Jeffries. She now works with Paul McCartney's music publishing. She's great. Um, she said, you know, you guys have to have a manager because we have no one to talk to on business, especially when you're on the road 300 shows a year, which I was. Someone has to be taking care of business. So we actively looked for managers. We talked, we had an attorney. That's how when we, had our con when we did our contract, we had to have an attorney. He um, had suggestions of managers that we could speak to that he felt personality-wise meshed with ours. Through that way, through that method, we found a manager that we liked. Most bands, I think, and most many successful acts that I've seen, usually have someone that's their manager who's also a friend of the band. Someone who they trust, who is um, from their sort of similar thinking and frame of mind. And like, I'm thinking right now of a group called REM. They were good friends of mine. Their manager, was someone who from also from Athens, Georgia, where they were from, who just was sort of like a friend and a fan of theirs, who believed in them so much that he became their manager and was very successful at getting them huge, by the way, record deals. Um, you know, often you can't, uh, so there's, those are two opposite ways of getting a manager. One is like you ask professionally around, who's a good manager. And the other one is just right in your own backyard. Like who is, who is here that really likes us or appreciates my work and who wants to promote my work. It could be as simple as that. Um, again, it's about being seen by the people that you admire. Like maybe my suggestion to Anonymous would be to find out who manages the acts that Anonymous likes. Like, I don't know the style of music that Anonymous is into, but what, who are the managers that are successful in that genre, in that style? And then seek them out. I mean, you might have to send them, in this case, you might have to send them some music, an introductory email, if that's the only way. Um, I, I would recommend that method, finding who manages the acts that you admire their careers because the manager is the one who's overseeing that career. So look for the ones who have careers that you admire and then seek them out. And you may have to write to them out of the blue. Sometimes now, that, that works. Is that advice the same if you're new? Like if I'm a new artist and yeah. I admire Beyonce, I mean, yeah. Yeah, I might hard. not get her, her manager per se. Would you say that that's the same thing or should I kind of try and lower my expectations a little bit? I think it's, you know, you may meet somebody just by trying, I think that's a good starting point to start for the big, start who you, who you think is big. Now, one thing is those big managers sometimes may not have time for you. And if Beyonce is one of their clients, that's a handful. So you got, you know, you might, that's why I was saying about somebody who's in your own backyard is often a good manager is because they don't have a Beyonce in their, in their, you know, uh, roster of talent. So it's a tricky one. It, it's, it's, a, it's one of those questions. This came up at our panel that we did once uh, for Center for Communication before about management. It's, a, it's hard to find a manager because it's like a spiritual relationship you have with them. It's, almost, it's a, a very unique situation. They, they become almost a parent figure. They become, it's pretty deep, you know? Yeah. Um, 
So it's hard. I think there's, there's not really one formula. I think that's the fact is that there's not really a formula, but you could try for ones who you admire because that may lead you to somebody else. Like by looking for, say, if you, Beyonce is perfect example. I mean, a great, com completely perfect career, you know, and everything, every step is a good step, you know? So you, you know that there's something proper happening there. So um, you could try that, but that may lead you to something else. And if your music cuts through to them, they may want to work with you or they may recommend someone. Okay. Awesome. Those are just some thoughts. You know, all of these people can write to me if they have specifics because it's hard to tell when it's a not with the music, you know, it's about the music itself. Right. You know, the thing is every musician is so different. So it's, it's not really, there's not like a blanket answer for like that because who knows what, how that music will resonate with someone. And um, music is a very strange thing because sometimes just the, the mood that they're in, like if you, get, if you get that manager on a good day, they may love that music that you send them. And then on another day, they may not. So it's really, there's a lot of magic in the air with music. You, you don't know what's gonna click, you know? Right. All right, let's get to our next question. Our next question comes from Chandra at NYU. Chandra, go ahead and ask your question. Hi, Richard. Thank you so much for being here today and helping all of us. So my question is related to Kathy's question. And um, I was wondering what you think we should be working on in general to get opportunities to break in the music industry. Thank you for your question. Um, it's always interesting with this industry in that you know, right now we're going through a very unusual period where performers can't really perform. I'm just, I would be on the road right now, actually. I would be right now on my way to do a show tonight, probably. Um, we're in a funny place where um, part of our work, a big part of our work can't really happen in the normal way. But the music industry is always constantly evolving and changing. So what should we be doing now and what could you be doing now, especially that you can't perform and invite people to shows because that is one way that you show what you do is by inviting them to a concert. Um, of course, you know, we're all doing online events. This is an example in a way of the, one of those and everyone is doing concert. I just did a couple of weeks ago, I did a full concert, full concert from my apartment, from the space which at first was, of course, an odd uh, idea and something I would never have dream dreamed I would be doing. Um, I think with, the in with this industry, you have to always be thinking ahead because, it's, because it does change so much. And um, you want to reach the people that you need to reach professionally and also your fans in every way that you can. So I think right now is a good time to develop that build i've been building up my youtube channel but i kind of let it was kind of dormant in a way it was just like okay official music video official music video official music video was all i ever put there now i'm putting stuff up every week i'm putting something up every few days sometimes you know i think now's a time to oh, to just put your music out there in every way that you can i would say if you're um the who is the questioner again please Sandra. Sandra, are you are, is Sandra an art a record, an artist or more on the business side? I'm a classical pianist. Beautiful. Well, okay. Well, I think you have to make some. I think you have to be heard in some way, and I think you have to make recordings more than ever, recordings and and with maybe with visuals if you can, yeah, of your music. Do you play, I mean, do you like to perform? Are you a performing artist or do you prefer recording? I'm a performing artist. I haven't really um, delved into recording yet, but that's something I'd be interested in checking out. I think, I think making performance videos as much as you can. People are very, the, the, um, the, um, the criticism, like the, the critical eye that people have for music videos right now is at a very, is in a different place because people are used to living room performances. So you're in an, you have an opportunity to make some very simple performance videos right now that would be appreciated by people who crave 
to hear beautiful performances. Do you see what I mean? This is, an op this is the opportunity side of what's happening, is that you, there are more open eyes and ears for very simple video productions. I would recommend making some. You know, I, I've been doing it myself. I'm just sharing what I've been doing. I mean, I have been doing this and it's, you know, I just did one from, for Lincoln Center last week, Lincoln Center's Humanity in Concert series. I was nerve, it was like scary to me to do it, but I did a performance for my living room, you know? I think you just have to do, that's how we're performing right now. So I would step up that game and focus in on making some really beautiful performance videos. Um, and I think this will help us in the future when you're back on the road in front of, or not back in the performance set setting with real people and the real audience. I think this will help you. That's awesome. my suggestion. And it's simple, but that's my suggestion. Well, no, that was great. And I just want to remind um, all the participants, if you guys have follow-up questions, feel free to, to follow up in the Q&A box. But I'll keep going. Our next question comes from um, Ariana. Let me bring her on. Ariana, go ahead and ask your question. Hi, uh, thank you so much, Richard, for speaking with us. Um, my question's about demos. Um, so, you know, I know in the past, of course, you'd have to get a, a legitimate demo done kind of in a recording studio, but now today it's, it's easy to do things just at home. Um, so I was just kind of wondering what it looks like uh, to make demos and send them out. Who and should we be sending them to? How should we be sending them? Um, and w exactly what level of quality and uh, sort of fullness do they need to be? Like, can it be just a piano demo, even if you know we want it to be full production eventually? Um, yeah, so what does that look like? That's another good question. And one that I have uh, dealt with many times because um, <laughs> that's always changing. Like right now people, I mean, I think the people know that we're making demos at home because we can't go into recording studios as much. Um, but you still have to make it as good as you possibly can because you can't really depend on the listener to always be able to hear your vision of what you want it to sound like. So my suggestion with making demos, do you, if you record at home, do you, do you record at home? Oh, I know you're muted now, I think. Yeah. Um, I, uh, yes, I just like very basically, I don't have a ton of equipment, but I have a keyboard and kind of a very basic microphone and like GarageBand. Gar well, I use GarageBand a lot. In fact, I was one of the consultants for Logic, which was really the, that's the real, the professional software, but I still use GarageBand because it's quicker at home. I get very good sounds out of GarageBand. I think you have to, exp I think if you want to make good demos at home, you can with GarageBand. I think just, um, uh, one suggestion would be to maybe have a, one microphone that you can use that's not just the built-in mic like I'm using here, uh, even though I do use this one sometimes for making demos. Um, I think it's good to have an outside microphone and just an, a, a way to get it into your computer, a USB connector. Um, and I think you can make very good demos in GarageBand. You have to use your own ears to listen and make sure it sounds like, you know, compare it to a record that you like that you think is the closest thing possible to what you want to sound like and try to make it at least sound in the same ballpark as something that you admire, something, a record that you like by someone else, you know? Um, because you're going to have to make it, you're going to have to give a pretty good picture of the sound you want for it to be truly a demo. If you don't, it's not really a demo, I don't think. If you don't, it's just a, a, ske a sketch. If you don't really give it a little bit of production value, to me, it's just a sketch of a song. So uh, that's one way to go. If your song is so great, if your lyrics are so fantastic that it doesn't need anything else, then your demo can be much less produced. If, if it's a pop song, most pop songs, you wanna give them the flavor of what kind of pop song it's gonna be and what kind of beat it's gonna have and what kind of, heaviness or lightness is gonna have. So you can do that in GarageBand and you can experiment with it. You know, you can really do a lot in there with the, with the uh, mastering, master uh, track. You can add, you can, it gives you a lot of choices to pump it up or not pump it up. Um, I, would, I would say make it sound as good as you can because you never know whose ears are gonna hear it. And 
they may not understand what you're trying to do. So give them every benefit, don't give them every benefit of the doubt. Give them something that sounds like what you want it to sound like as much as you can, even though we can't be in studios right now. I hope that answers it. Again, you can write to me if you have specific questions, um, a specific specifics to your question, you know? Awesome. Our next question comes from Fernanda. And let's bring Fernanda on to ask. Go ahead, Fernanda, and ask your question. Hi, Richard. It's a huh? pleasure to talk to you. Thank you. Uh, I know that you're involved with Anthology Film Archives, and yeah. I think that's amazing. I'm an experimental filmmaker, and I wanted to ask if you have any advice for anyone that is trying to break into uh, the indie music scenario as a filmmaker. Wow. Uh, yeah, doing music videos and all that. Yeah, you know, I just worked with an indie filmmaker from, um, from Venezuela who just made my new music video that's coming out next month and I love it, he's great. And we used drones and it's very experimental. Um, I love experimental film, that's why I'm on the board at Anthology, yes. Uh, and I do see a correlation between music videos as I said earlier, I was one of the first MTV artists. So we got involved with, we had a lot of interesting directors that worked with us and they were experimental. Some of them became very famous. Um, I think music videos gives you a great opportunity to show your experimental work. And musicians are always, I'm one of them, always looking for directors to make music videos. So I would, I would advertise that you are available to do a music video. And you will find that you will have great work for your portfolio and it's a great expression of your work, uh, art by making music videos. Um, what, so one way to break in, uh, you know, at NYU, of course, there's a fantastic film department and I work with them a lot. My previous, one of my previous videos was made by students at NYU. You could, um, you're not a student though, right now. Or are you? Sorry, I know you're muted. <laughs> Hi. Uh, no, I was a student at City College of New York. Yeah, but I just graduated. Yeah. <laughs> you were you in the film program at City College? Yeah. That was a great, it's a great program. I worked with one of my other video directors was from, from City College also. Oh, really? Uh, yes, Ryan, his name is Ryan Bajan. He was just graduated last year. Um, well, um, I think you could, you know, use social media to make your do you have a, a, of course you must use social media in some way. I think you could have a designated uh, page, you should have a, a, a designated page for your work. And you can also offer that you're looking to make music videos. I think that's nothing wrong with just saying that. You know, you may get too many offers, but you can pick the ones that you want to do. I think it's a great opportunity when you work with music videos, you can do whatever you want. There's not a, necessarily a script, you create the script, you know? Awesome. Um... So our next question comes from Andy. Andy, go ahead and ask your question. Um, hi, Richard. It Hello. is a pleasure to meet you. Nice to meet um, you. So I have a two question and it could be obvious question, but um, the first question is what skills are essential to become an audio engineer or mixing engineer other than how to use like Pro Tools or other DAWs? And the second question is how do you think the crisis we are going through will affect the music industry in the future? Those are such good questions and both, uh, you know, hard to answer in certain ways. What, uh, but the engineering part of it, let me answer that one first. Um, I, I had to learn how to engineer because I needed to do it. I, had a I was starting a band in high school and I rented a recording studio and I didn't like the sound the engineer was getting. So I asked if I could take over and I did. And I started engineering. Um, I'm not, I did not learn at a school how to engineer, but um, I learned out of necessity. Um, in those days I was using analog recording. So it was all about how things reacted to being, how sounds reacted to going on tape. That was a different world. Um, I think now, I think 
There are courses, of course, in university, university level courses about engineering. I have participated in them. I've spoken at them and I've been a guinea pig where they've used my music and I've been an artist for students to work with learning engineering. And I think, I think learning, have taking a course is a very valuable, could be very valuable to have, but you still have to be, you still have to have the hands-on experience of doing it yourself on your own as much as possible. So I would suggest a balance of studying and taking a course at university or some place. My department at NYU, of course, was the Clive Davis Institute of Recorded Music, which had classes on recording and mixing, of course. But you may find another school that's suitable for you. I would take classes, but I think you have to always engineer at the same time on your own and having to learn how to get around problems and solutions. All of engineering, of every kind of engineering, not just audio engineering, all engineering is problem solving. So you have to have a situation where you have a problem to solve. And there's no better place than just not a school situation, but a work situation where you have to solve a problem. So I would balance those two things. I would take a class and I would also be engineering somewhere, try to engineer all the time as much as you can. That's how you get to be a great engineer. In England, I, what, where I first started recording was in England. And they have programs there where they, they hire, like they have like, um, like an internship where they slowly let the interns start taking over the sessions. And some of the best, most important international producers started out as just the intern, you know, at the studio. They call it tea boy or tea girl, the person that makes the tea. And then they end up pretty much making records for Elton John. And, you know, they, it's, they, they do it step by step. The reason is so you learn how to solve problems along the way. You know, you start just assisting and then you eventually take over. Um, so try to combine those two, try to really learn because now we have constantly evolving technology. You have to learn that, but you should also be actually working at the same time. Like don't waste time, just learning, You're doing. Okay, that's my answer for that. That's my suggestion for that. Now, as far as the music industry dealing with this situation now and the, you know, I, it's, we're all at a loss. We're trying to deal with it the best we can. I need to get into a studio to make a track right now for a assignment that I have on a song. I'm trying to figure out how I'm gonna get in there to do it. The studios are closed basically, you know. Um, whatever happens, we have to use this as a learning experience. The COVID-19 crisis, I mean. Um, all of these workarounds that we're having to do, all of these things that we're having to, like I said earlier to another question about performing in these different situations in our homes or making videos that we don't normally make, let this all be a learning experience. So we have, we have learned how to solve yet another problem. You know, it just increases our knowledge on how to deal with things in general, but also with how to make our music evolve constantly. You know, I, I don't have an answer to where we're going to be headed because I don't even know how long this is going to be lasting, you know, with COVID-19. But if I think of anything more, I'll, I will answer you if you'd like to write me an email. Awesome. Um, Sorry, my answers are so long, Fall Day. No, I think, they're my, I, great. I think they're great. I'm learning a lot. I think this is great. I think we're learning a lot. That's great. It's better than a really quick answer. I think it's I just really want to good. share what, as much as I can when I'm in a situation to answer a question, you know? No, I think we're all really appreciate it. It's great. Okay. Our next question comes from Emily, and I'll go ahead and ask on Emily's behalf. She's actually a recent grad from the City College of New York, and she asks, what sort of requirements would you need to become an artist manager? She says, I know you don't necessarily need a certain degree, but what should you know? Is it more based on experience already within the industry? Or, you know, how do you, how do you basically make that jump to becoming, you yeah. know, your friend's manager or someone's manager? You know, for me, you know, I already, like when I was doing my introduction, I spoke about all these different things I've done, et cetera. And I, you know, so it's a bunch of stuff, diff different things. I'm, I still do acting whenever I get it. I'm in two movies that are coming out this summer, which is great. But one thing that I did one year, I came home from a tour. I was, I was signed to Universal Records. I did a long tour. I was kind of exhausted, but I needed to have a year where I could write songs and maybe do something different. I wasn't sure what I was going to do for my next album. And I was very interested in entertainment law at that time. I always have been. 
I, like I was saying, I love, I have my contracts because once in a while I bring them out to understand what I did, you know, but I found an attorney, an older attorney who was well known in the music industry and entertainment industry in general, actors and stuff. They, I had heard his name. I went to him and I offered to be his assistant with no pay for as long as he wanted me to, just so I could go to every meeting and sit with him and I'll just, I would do whatever that he needed to be done. You don't have to pay me, just let me learn. Mm -hmm. And I did that and I just apprenticed and I, I, I would ask about contracts, like what does this mean? And I learned how to do my own contracts through that period. I learned how to make contracts instead of 45 pages long, one or two pages long. And I learned how to not have to pay my attorney so much money every time I needed to sign in a contract. Because sometimes there's a lot of contracts, like even for an event like today, of course we didn't do a contract, but there's always an agreement that we have to sign, right? Well, you know, in the music industry, there's a lot of agreements that we have to sign and it's expensive. So I wanted to learn as much about law as I could. Um, I think that's not a bad thing is to learn contract law. Because then if you represent your client, you may have to still get an attorney. And I recommend getting an attorney. Believe me, I mean, I've been yelled at for what I just said. For what I just said about not using an attorney, I've been yelled at by attorneys. But I will say it's good to at least know where you're headed uh, on a contract. So for a manager, I would be very, as an artist, I would be very grateful if my manager had a little background on contract law. And that you can learn that in different places. You could take courses, there are pre-law courses, all kinds of law classes and courses on and offline that you could take to learn contracts, um, especially in relating to entertainment. I would suggest that. I would suggest if you're gonna, if you wanna be a manager, I love managers but I like them especially if they know contracts <laughs> because then they can guide you better and you can sort of know what the choices are, you know? Like my manager knew that, you know what? You should be signing license agreements instead of signing everything away and letting the record company own 100% of everything. Like it's better that you share it and that they can have the record for a certain number of years and then that expires. Things like that are good to know. I wish my... I wish I would have had a first manager. I didn't have that manager back then. I'd had no manager, but I would have been very happy if they would have told me that when I started. So I think there's certain fundamentals and rudimentary law things that you should have as a manager. That's a suggestion. So, so when you first get started, do manager, do most managers have some kind of law background or do they no. have, or do artists have attorneys? Is it generally the manager who's handling all of those contracts for the artist? No, generally an artist has both a manager and an attorney, but I feel it's good if, you're, if your manager already has a good grasp of what the contract can be, like what our choices are. I think then when you go to the attorney, it makes it a lot faster and a lot easier and smoother operation than having no idea, you know? So I think it's worthwhile for a manager to have a good idea of the law, even knowing that a lawyer is going to have to maybe do the final contract have them look at it, that's the, that's the way to officially do that. But I, I would appreciate a manager who has a little bit of a background knowing the options that are, that, are, that are available to us as artists. You know, one thing I wanted to add in here, just as, this is not one of the questions, but something I've been wanting to say in here, is that don't forget that the artist is the reason the whole industry exists. Without the artist, they have nothing. Without the content that we create, the music, the videos, the personalities, everything that we make and that we live and that we give, all of that is what makes the industry, music industry happen. So you have to always keep that in mind. Like even though the big companies are big and rich, the artist is the reason that they exist. So, you know, we have a lot of power in that. So we don't want to completely relinquish that, even though we form a partnership with the record company. That doesn't mean that we're giving them everything away, you know, and that's very important to keep in mind for artists. Sometimes you're overwhelmed by the idea of the power of a record label. I love them. I work with them my whole life, but I also know that my role is important to them. So I just want to add that in there to all the artists that are listening. <laughs> awesome. No, that was really great. So we have two more questions, which is that cool? Two more questions. Whatever you like. Apologies to everyone if we are not able to get to your question, but we have two more. 
Um, so the first one comes from Connor from Endicott College. Connor, go ahead and ask your question. Hey, Richard. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. So I've been interested in doing a music career since I was really, really young. And I like to think of it as my whole backup plan if my intentions for the screenwriting career that I have don't pan out. I also am planning to move to New York City to start my career there once this whole pandemic is over. But I understand that both the entertainment and the music industry are not necessarily in the same place that they were in the past and it can get really stressful. So what do you suggest for staying as long as possible in the industry? Wow. Well, what was your backup? You said music industry, but what was your backup, your other, your other choice? Screenwriting career is my first choice. Music career is my backup choice. Well, those are both great. I love, I love both fields are, are fantastic. You know, screenwriting is a great field and it's something you can do on completely on your own, which is also good. Cause you know, with music, we tend to be part of a music community. You know, we work with engineers and other musicians, et cetera, a screenwriter, you write on your own. So that's always a good, you can always screenwrite. You can still be a screenwriter while you're a musician. You know, that's one thing you can just do on your own. Also one feeds the other because the creativity, you know, the idea, all of this is about creativity. All of this, uh, both fields and all the fields we're talking about in this entire conversation today are about creativity. The most important thing is to be creative and to create. Now, that could end up a screenwriting, could, you could end up, it could be a screenplay or it could be a song or a musical, et cetera. It's basically, it's the same thing. It's a creative entity, you know? Um, I don't think you have to choose one over the other. You could do screenwriting, you can do music altern alternate, alternately and at the same time and simultaneously, you know, really. Um, but uh, as far as the situation now, you know, the best thing to do is to write and to be creative. This is a great, this is an opportunity now to focus on the creative aspect of all that we do. It, writing music, coming up with ideas for large scale music, pro, uh, uh, you know, things like an album or a musical or, some, or, you know, a play with music or, you know, now's the time. Sometimes these things happen, you know, this is a terrible situation we're in, but maybe it's useful. It's useful in that it's focus, makes us focus inwardly because that's where the creativity is inside of us. So maybe this is a time to look inward to see what you want to do with the screenplay or music or both. Maybe can she combine those and make a screenplay with music? You know what I mean? I, I would say that use this time now more than usual to just focus on the creativity you know, with a capital C, the, the, the real source of what we do, being creative. Use this to be a create, use this time as a creative time. You know, it gets weird that we can't do everything else, but focus on the creativity. I hope that's a good answer for you. Well, that was great. I think we might take two more. There's a couple of good. interesting questions in here. Good, Get, um, lay it on me. <laughs> the next one is from Pablo. And let me, let's bring Pablo on. Pablo, go ahead and ask your question. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hi there. Hi, Richard. I um, appreciate you for being able to uh, speak and Emma Bowen for setting this up. Um, so first of all, I was doing my homework, you know, before I got on the call and noticed, you know, you worked with Pete Seeger and, and Lou Reed. It's amazing. Yeah. You know, I used to sing um, This Land is Your Land, This Land is Mine wow. when I was in elementary school. So yeah, that's cool. He, he um, was a great artist, and see, he taught us. Just to interrupt, he taught us about using message in music and have the power of that. You know, from right. you know. So yes, go ahead. No, yeah, I I just think that's amazing, and uh, yeah, thanks for uh, you know sparing some time. But uh, just to give like some very brief context, so I'm wrapping up undergrad in ATL. You know, just since I was a sophomore, I've been pretty uh, focused on on you know making music something. Um, you know, pivotal in, in my in my career. Yes. And uh, over over time, my childhood friend and I, um, we went to middle school together, been able to uh, create these relationships to get him a couple placements on some records that have done pretty decently. Um, I live in Atlanta and he lives in California. 
Um, but, you know, we've just been on it, on the ball. I mean, there's great technology to utilize to be able to um, remain connected. But, you know, we're taking the steps now to get um, an attorney involved and, you know, we're starting to get serious. And um, I'm going to be starting full-time in September in New York. Uh, I just wanted to know if there's just any general advice you have on, on our next steps or anything you would advise. So what have you done? What Do you have any music out? Like you said, you have music out publicly now? Yes, yeah. So uh, and, uh, with Pacifics, he's a producer, and, you know, he, he has um, uh, basically 50% on most of those, well, ba basically all those records that he has out. Do you, are you writing or producing? Do you write? I don't myself. I'm playing the manager role. Oh, cool. Uh -huh. Well, you know, if you're coming to New York, I mean, this, in normal situations, New York is the music center, I think. You know, I chose it. When I signed to Universal Music, I went out to LA for a while, but I came right back here because I find New York to be, it just, the mix of people here seems to work for me. It just is, it is a melting pot and I like that, you know, and I think musically, for musical styles, it seems like New York gives you a lot of oppor more opportunities than anywhere else. Um, again, the music industry is about relationships. So, you know, you, you just want to meet and you, you, if you're in the manager situation, that's especially important to meet contacts for your artists, you know? I mean, you depend, they depend on the managers to help make those connections um, that will get them to get their music into new places that, that it hadn't gotten to before. So I would suggest that you, I would suggest to almost everyone on this call, if they're actively working in music, that they join either as Grammy U or as a regular member, if they've already graduated, a member of the Recording Academy. I'm on the board of governors of the Academy and we do stuff all year long. We do events that are just for networking and meeting all year long. We don't just do the Grammy Awards show, which people just, that's what they know us for. That's a small slice of what we actually do during the year. We work with charities like Music Cares, that's our charity, and it helps a lot of musicians that are in need. But we do events all year long where we meet each other and talk about ideas. I've met, I've worked with so many of my colleagues, just the ones that I met at the Recording Academy. So I would suggest, or that organization or something else where you can actually meet other colleagues that you can sh help promote your artists to. You know, it's all about relationships and the manager is, the, is like sometimes the interface between, because an artist sometimes is shy about this. An artist is often, even though they go on stage and can be out, um, wild or ostentatious or whatever the word would be, then, at home and anytime else, they're kind of shy. So the manager is the one who then is the performer, you know, to get them the contacts that they need. So I would suggest if you're going to come to New York, I would join the Recording Academy and other organizations where you can meet colleagues. I hope that's a good answer. That would be my suggestion, though, for real. Okay, awesome. And so our final question comes from Katie. Katie, go ahead and ask your question. Hi, I'm so glad that I was able to come to this. This is very exciting and very oh. helpful. Um, so thank you so much. I'm Katie. I graduated from Princeton in 2018. I live in New York. And my question is, um, is it worth, in your opinion, signing a less than amazing contract as a way of getting started? I um, have... I'm a composer, so I do lyrics, and but I also sing, and some composing, but I, I work with a band. And we have some opportunities potentially to go forward, but it's really hard to pick what to do because often as new artists, it's, it's a situation of, okay, yeah, I'll start with you, but here's your soul. I'm putting it in a jar and I'll just hold on to it. And I'm okay with that maybe as long as it's not wrong. Well, I'm so glad you asked that because that really goes back to my, when I said the, my RCA contract from when I was 20 years old is still on my desk. <laughs> well, recently it's come back out. It was put away for a long time. But, uh, you know, that's, let me just tell you, that was my situation. I signed a contract that was 80% to the record label and 20% to the artist. Wow. I'm going to repeat that. 80% wow. to the record label, 20% to the artist. And you know what? That was common then. We, it's a new world now. 
we want, what we look for in a contract is a more 50-50 thing. If you can get a contract to be basically 50% to the artist, 50% to the label, something in that world, in that ballpark, then you're in good shape. And I think you can do that now. I don't think you have to sign away 80% of your income to the record label. Um, I would suggest that, yes, you have to make it, you have to do your, a first dive into the world of signing contracts. You have to do it at some point, but make it as fair as you can, or it'll later haunt you. So just get it to be as best as you can. Try, I mean, indie labels will ask for 50%. They give you very little in return as far as any of this, no, sometimes no advance money, et cetera. The major labels will give you an advance. That, that's the trade-off. It depends on what you want to do and what you need to do. If you need the money and an art, and they're giving you a lot of money up front, it may be worth to sign it. But then just know that later on, that contract may bother you that you signed away a lot, a larger percentage of what you want to give. So I think you have to weigh all the options. Understand, try to understand what your options are. Um, without giving me the name of the artist, can you tell me what kind of percentage split that contract is? And I'll tell you if it's good or bad. Oh yes, for sure. So this is actually, it's, um, it's not directly with the record label. It's the specific, and I'm happy to email you more of the yeah. specifics of it, but basically. Um, it's a production my, it's, yeah, it's a production and management company yeah. that, and the percent is good. He actually wants to give uh, the band 80% and as the really? manager, he would take 20, which feels very on the up and up for me. That's just My good. thought is, yeah, he um, was really big in the 90s and hasn't done as much work recently. And so I'm wondering if it's worth signing a contract that's longer with him. Because I've worked with him off contract a bit just to get like freelancing and I, I like it. And now I'm just trying to make the right move as an artist because on the one hand, he has major connections with like Motown and Columbia House. And on the other hand, he hasn't worked with them in a while. And I don't know how much the industry's changed. And I don't know a polite way to ask him about it. It has changed a lot since the 90s. But I would say this, one thing you could always do, could, you could ask for a trial period. Like why sign everything at the beginning? Can't you say, let's give it a year? I mean, I would, I would say six months, but that's a little too short. Most people, would, it's hard to get a lot done just in six months. So you may want to say, well, let's do it like this and then take it from there. Like, can we maybe have some sort of a trial period of, I did this, I think, I'm, I'm not sure, but I think I did this once before where I did a deal where I, so well, let's give it a year and then if not, we'll, it will resign after a year. And then the, from then on, it's like a longer period. Um, if you can get some sort of trial period, maybe that's good. Unless you are more and more sold on this person, uh, the more you research about their, asking them about their contacts, how current they are. I mean, the record industry is very different now than it was in the 90s. And the record industry is always changing. When I was signed to RCA Records, that first label I signed to, while I was there, they were bought by three different corporations while I was still there. And they were complete, the company changed every single time they were bought. So things are always changing. Um, I would try for some sort of a trial period, if you can. The thing is, of course, the work you do during that period, you know, you have to, you have to work out the nuance of that, that maybe it's too long for this answer for this question. But if you can work out some sort of a trial period with someone, that would be great. And you can write to me on an email. We can figure that out. Richard, oh my gosh, this has been amazing. I actually, I, I think I'm going to rewatch this again and, it's, it's, <laughs> and take notes. It's been so good. You know, I just tried to turn off the filter and just answer the questions with no bullshit. You, know? you did. It was great. If you want to just give any um, final thoughts, um, please, please do. No, just always remember that the artists, you know, that our content, our creativity is the key. So whenever there's a problem, whenever things are, are wrong or things are not going well, always go back to your creativity. Work on your music. Work on, if you're managing, learn more about what you can do with your management. Learn more about the law. You know, use our downtime to improve ourselves. And always, always for artists, always remember that it's, it's, the industry exists because of us. So never feel like it's, um, you know, that we're in a, in a, sec a second class situation. We're not. We are the, we are the reason that the, mu the music industry exists. 
So we should always be very proud of that and, and, um, and stand up for our rights, you know? Thank you so much, Richard. I just want to say before I do my, our, you know, the, the quick closing remarks, um, I know Richard um, said that he was willing to give out his email address. So anybody who's interested in following up with Richard with any follow-up questions, you can go to our website. You can find my email then. Just shoot me an email and I will forward, you know, all, all questions, all, everyone who wants to follow up with, with Richard, I will forward them to him so that you have his, e his, his, his um, email information. Um, but thank you so much, Richard. This was awesome. Um, to all of our attendees, we invite you to sign up for our newsletter um, via, our, via our website, um, centerforcommunication.org, so you can find out about more upcoming events. If you enjoyed our discussion this afternoon, please consider to make a donation to the center. We are a nonprofit so that we can keep these events free for students. Um, visit our website at centerforcommunication.org slash donate. Thanks, everyone. Take care.